is uh, Mike Moore, and I'm grateful to be your plenary keynote. This is a big honor. <laughs> um, so I am going to uh, let's actually just play this thing. I'm going to be speaking about writing games. Now, if I was Aaron Patterson, I'd be saying, "You don't need games in Ruby." Woo! But I'm not. Um, I forgot to push, but when we're done with this, you can go there and get the uh, code that I'm about to show, and you can follow the progression uh, with the commits. All right, so um, the first thing is uh, we're going to be using Gosu. Uh, now, Gosu is a great minimalistic game library. It's not really a framework. It's a uh, it's, uh, not that opinionated. It's basically the least amount of of code that you need in order to write a platform independent game. It is not that new GoSu language, that JVM abomination thing that just came out. Uh, that's completely different. So we're about to get hurt by Google on that. Um, so libgosu.org. You can go there, you can read uh, the RDoc. It's a C library that's also got first class Ruby uh, bindings for it. So there's a lot of really great Ruby games that are written in GoSu. <coughs> So just gen install it, and it should install on most of your platforms. So if you're on Linux, there's a, a wiki page to help you make sure you can install. OK, so the first thing we're going to do is we're going to create a Hello World application. Now, like a couple years ago, there were a lot of game kind of presentations at Ruby Conference, and I uh, was really excited about them. And each one of them showed a different kind of game uh, library or framework. Um, they never really showed the process of making games. And this was something that I really wanted to know more about. And I thought this would be something that would be uh, beneficial for people to kind of follow along. If you look at the description of this talk, it says we're going to go from nothing to a working game in 45 minutes. Um, I said a lot of things in that description. I'm not really quite sure if they're going to come true, but uh, that's kind of the uh, <laughs> that's the goal. So first thing we're going to do is we're going to I'm got my mad typing skills here. Uh, we're going to open up a new file. We're going to require Ruby gems and GoSu, and then we're going to create our demo game class. Now we're going to inherit from Gosu window, and this is important because in Gosu, uh, the only thing that can actually draw to the screen is window. So we need to uh, inherit from that. That's pretty much the only thing we need to inherit from. Now, I like to, in my initializer, have width, height, and full screen passed in, and then just call super. Um, then you don't have to put that anywhere else. That by itself doesn't give us a whole lot. I mean, this is a hell of a world, so let's go ahead and add a caption. This is going to add whatever we write here to the title bar of our, of our game. How do you install Gosu? Gem install Gosu. All right. Can you write your text No, I cannot. Uh, <laughs> um, so, we, <laughs> <laughs> this is all recorded. I can't do that. Um, it's 15 point. It's a small screen. Uh, libgosu.org has got a, uh, all the documentation, all the R doc up there. So here's the documentation for window. Um, if you look at it, window's got a couple of methods. Close is one that I care about because I don't like to click the button. It's also got a button up and a button down method. And that's gonna get called every time a button is, is uh, depressed or unpressed. So we're gonna just go ahead and implement the button down. And it's gonna get passed in the ID of the button. There are some constants that's gonna help make our code a little more readable. So we're just gonna close if the button that was pressed is escape. And I'll finish typing that, and then run it. And then if I hit escape, no more hunting and pecking with the uh, mouse. So there you go. So that's our first quote unquote game. Uh, and now you know. It's like if they would have just done that two years ago, I wouldn't be here. Uh, so the, the thing that's different from game developing, development from most other like uh, desktop application development is the game loop. A lot of uh, the other desktop apps kind of wait on user input and they have this kind of message pump that they're going to pull from. But other than that, they try to be really, um, they don't want to take too many resources. The game, we don't care, right? We want to take as many resources and we want to go full throttle all the time. So Gosu has a game loop. And in this game loop, every time through the loop, it's going to call the update method and it's going to call the show method. So that's going to be important. The first set of demos are. Uh, we're going to go through, just going to worry about uh, draw, um, but a little bit later on we're going to talk a little bit more about uh, update. 
So to draw, I want to draw a rectangle. Now, Ghostit has draw quad, which has got a lot of parameters. So Ryan Davis actually had this really great uh, helper method, draw rectangle. So let's just draw a 200 by 200 white box in the middle of the screen. Um, so we do that with our height and width. Now the x and y coordinate are going to be the coordinates from the top left, right? Um, so here we have our top left, and then we're going to offset that with our height and width. And then we're going to paint this white, and that's what that does. Okay. Oh. So that's not really too interesting. We want to do something a little more than just print out a square. So we're going to animate it. All we're going to do is we're going to change our offset of where we're starting. So where that ori the originating x and y coordinate on the upper left of that box, we're just going to be modifying that. There's a couple of ways we could do that. If we take the sign of current time, we get a nice uh, recurring number that's going to kind of come around. We can, we can get some animation. Because the game loop is happening at this, at this point 60 <laughs> frames a second, it's going to call update and draw 60 times each second. And so when we do that, we get the illusion of movement. And unfortunately, the screen capture didn't do a great job. It's a lot smoother when you see it live. Right. Um, so we can go ahead and go back and forth. If we change that to sine and cosine, we get a nice little elliptical looking animation. Indeed. Um, and if we we can change that. Uh, this is a little animation I kind of like where you take the sine and the cosine of the current time for the x coordinate, and then you take the tangent for the y coordinate, and then the box drops off the screen. It's kind of silly, but it's not too bad. Yeah. You know, and this is, you know, early, early stuff, but again, I had a little hard time kind of finding this type of, uh, this type of introduction. All right, we don't care about boxes. Let's add something and make it look a little bit prettier. So what we're going to do is we're going to create an image. Uh, we're going to take this background image, it's 800 by 600, which is the size of our window, and we're going to create that as a GoSu image, passing in the window, because the window is the, what you're drawing to. We need to, that reference to that window when we actually create our uh, image object. And then we can just call draw, and again, we're going to do it at uh, the zero x and y, upper, upper top left. And when we do that, we get a nice picture of the background. We still have our white box blue. So we should probably fix that. Let's see. So we're going to add a ninja, because ninjas are cool, right? Yeah, that was a few years ago. Um, who's going to add a little image? Same type of thing. We're going to add it uh, in the initializer. And then when we draw, we, what we want to do is instead of uh, drawing this box, we're going we're gonna to draw the image. And instead of keeping the height and width of a box in the draw method, we're just going to grab it from our, uh, our ninja object. So images have a height, images have a width. Um, and then we just call draw, pass in the x and y coordinate, and then the z coordinate, which is the z layer up and down, how close we are to the player. So we do that, and now we have a uh, nice little animated image floating on the screen. What's nice about Gosu as well is it, it supports bitmap and PNG, so you have the full alpha blending on all the images. So you can, even though I'm using kind of crappy developer art, you can come up with some really nice visuals just using these, uh, just using standard artwork. All right, so I think the ninja by itself is not enough. We need a ninja and a ruby. So let's go ahead and add the Ruby image. And I want to have a slightly different uh, animation, so we're going to kind of hammer on this placement just a little bit. Um, yeah, I think what we're going to do is sine plus cosine over sine, and then sine over tangent. I think that did something. The other thing, too, is when we're drawing the ninja and we're drawing the ruby, they both have the same z index. Uh, if we change that to y, then it also um, uh, 
it'll pull the one image in front and, and from, from behind. So if we go back and look at that again, uh, so the Ruby is behind the ninja and then the ninja is behind the Ruby. So that's kind of cool. All right, that's kind of ugly code, I admit it, but it got us to where we're at, so let's go ahead and refactor this. Um, if we pull out the ninja into its own class and the Ruby into its own class, uh, that holds both the X and Y coordinate and also is responsible for draw and also the animation. Now our demo game here is pretty simple, right? and it works the same way that it did before. So let's go back real quick. Um, so basically, our game is just going to create a background, create a ninja, create a ruby, and then we're just going to draw them. Right? So it's pretty simple. So uh, refactoring this logic into its own objects is a, is a good thing. All right, so let's take a look at a real life example. Um, which one do you say here? North. All right. So this is a game. Let's see if we get some sound. Uh, that was written by a developer, Ippa, I'm not sure what his real name is. Uh, he's uh, somewhat active in the Gosu community, uh, working on a, uh, a framework built on top of Gosu called Chingu, which this was written in. Uh, and this, was, this game was written in a weekend uh, by a single developer, including all the artwork and all the code. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about that later on. The game is pretty simple. Um, you are this little dragon, you can kind of hop, you can also squish down and grab things, and then throw. <coughs> Point is, <goes. laughs> let's see if I can get it in my, you want to kill that key. All right. I'm so nervous I can't put the game. <laughs> So, and then it's got 10 levels of difficulty and I have yet to beat it. But this was written uh, all in Ruby and the source code is all available up on GitHub. So we have kind of our first working graphical kind of display. Uh, it's not a complete game. Um, and you saw in the game that we just walked, we just saw the North game, uh, there were uh, little characters that moved around that had a different type of animation. So that's a called a sprite. So we're going to build a sprite next. Um, as we do here, let's take a look at the snake game. So this looks kind of similar to the earlier demo where we are going to create a snake sprite. Um, when we click escape, we're going to close it. When we update it, we're going to set, we're going to keep track of the current time. And the only reason I do this is because uh, it, if we have some of those mathematical calculations, it's nice to have the same uh, time each time uh, for each calculation instead of grabbing time to undo each, each calculation. And then on draw, we're just going to draw that snake. So, uh, you know, hopefully that looks pretty simple. Um, let me take a look at the sprite here, and uh, we're going to initialize it. We're going to get that window again because we need that to draw to. Um, and then we're going to create, instead of creating an image, we're going to create a tile. Um, and this is actually just an array of images. And we do that with the go to image load tiles there on line 11. And we're going to uh, pull up the uh, snake block tile, and I'll show that in just a little bit. Um, and then on draw, we're just going to draw the very first one. And again, the center is going to be in the center, of the, the location is going to be in the center of the screen. So if we move forward with that, that's it. And that kind of does a sucky game. I agree. So let's do something a little bit different. I'd like it to change direction. I'd like to go left and right. So we're going to have a very literal called direction. Right now it's pointing right. And then when I call move left or move right, on the snake sprite, I just want it to flip. So when we move right, we're going to set that direction to right. When we move left, we're going to set that direction to left. And then when we draw it, what we're going to do is we're going to check and see if we're, if our direction is right, then we're going to draw it the way it is right now. 
If it's left, then we need to mirror that, that image. In order to do that, um, we're going to have to offset the location as well. So the x location is going to be x plus the, plus the width. And then these other two uh, very, um, parameters that we haven't seen so far on draw because the default is 1. These are the, uh, the not offset, I forget, the factor or something. But it'll, uh, you can adjust how big or small the image is, right? So the default is 1. If you put it at uh, 0 0.5, it would be uh, half the size. Oh, and here's the other thing, too. Uh, on the button down, in order to tell if we're going to move left or right, we need to look for the left arrow or the right arrow. And so our game is going to keep track of the input and then update our sprite for us. So if we do that, now we can switch left and right, and our snake changes direction. Okay. It's not exciting enough just to change direction. We want a little bit of movement. Movement's not too bad. Uh, we're going to just offset our X position each frame. Again, because we're doing it uh, so many times a, a second, that's going to give us the illusion of movement. Uh, so here we're setting our movement to be four pixels. So once every game loop, we're going to move four pixels. Now here, I actually have to keep pressing the arrow in order to move, because I can't just press down the key. Um, that's because our moving is only on key button down. So if we change that to our update, and we check for button down instead of button uh, pressed, then we can actually hold the key down and it will move for us. And so here's a demo of it moving somewhat smoothly. Alright, so it needs to do more than just uh, move. Um, here is the sprite that, uh, that we loaded. Now, so far, we've only been uh, drawing the first image on the left. So what I'd like it to do is I'd like it to cycle uh, about four or five times a second, going from the first to the second. So it looks like the snake is kind of slithering on the ground. So I'll go ahead and do that. Uh, to do that, we need to know how fast to animate app. Um, and then I didn't really go with any uh, industry standard animation techniques. I just kind of did something that I thought worked pretty well. Uh, you see, we're just going to change out our frame. Right now, it's always been zero, but we're going to give it a different implementation. We're going to take the current time, and we're going to divide it by the animation speed, and take the modulus of that. That's going to give us a, a fraction of a, uh, uh, between zero and one. And then uh, I'm going to multiply that times the number of tiles that we have, in this case two, and that's going to give us our index and our animation array. So if we do that, then it actually uh, animates, and we can kind of move around the screen, and we get the illusion that it's, it's doing more. What's nice about this approach as well is that uh, because these are just variables, we can change the animation speed, and we can change the movement to two different effects. So we can make like a hyper really animated snake, or you can make someone that's just really lethargic um, just by changing those two, uh, those two variables. Yeah? Do you know uh, any tool for editing sprites and like working out the actual um, individual frames for your animation? You know, there are tools. Um, I intentionally kind of stayed away from them for this because I really wanted to get more about the concepts of, of building games and kind of show that it's really, it's, it really is accessible, right? It, you don't need to, uh, to learn a giant monolithic framework in order to build a game. Um, a couple, literally a couple hundred lines of, of Ruby code, and you have everything that you need. So um, there, there definitely are tools. I really didn't uh, want to kind of open that chat Pandora's box. So, so, so. Um, I kind of like the current movement that we had before. Uh, now, I'd like it this, this sprite to do a little more than just kind of move. Um, and so we're going to add two different uh, cycles, right? The first two is going to be like a walk cycle. And then the, the next three are going to be some sort of attack cycle, right? Um, now, these different cycles can have different frame rates, and they can also have different speeds with this, this approach that I'm doing now. Uh, again, some of the other game frameworks probably standardize that. Uh, I have a little bit of an opinion on that. 
So but again, so the first two are our walk, and then the last three are going to be an attack. So we're going to go ahead and add that. First thing we're going to do is change our asset to include the attack frames as well. And I'm just going to go ahead and add all of these variables. So we've got a walk movement, a walk speed, and the number of walk frames. We've also got attack speed, number of attack frames, and then a time. And the reason the time is important because I want to know precisely when the attack happened. I don't want to just take any random kind of like animated cycle time. Otherwise, the attack might end at the end of the attack and then cycle to the beginning. Right? So every time we animate an attack, I want it to start over fresh. So it's important to keep, keep track of that time. Um, to know if we're attacking, we're just going to check to see if our attack time plus the attack speed is greater than now. So if, if that's greater than now, then we're attacking. If not, then we're walking. So we've got these helper methods, attack and walk. And then when we do attack, we're going to call attack bang. And what that's going to do is it's going to set the attack time to the current time only if we're not already attacking. Now, when we move, I only want to move when we're walking, so we're going to add a little bit of ugly code here just to uh, only move when we're walking. And uh, that kind of makes me feel icky, but uh, we're also going to add a whole lot of logic to the frame logic here, because we've got one set of one piece of logic for walking, and we've got another set of logic specifically for attacking. And the reason for that is because I want to uh, make sure that we're always starting the animation from the beginning of the attack going through to the end. So we're going to um, take the window's time, minus the attack time, and then uh, divide that by the attack speed, modulus one, and then we're going to take the, we're going to take the, up here at 164, we're going to take the index of that times the, the, uh, the attack frames. Then we, now we have to add the walk frames on top of it, right? Because the first two were walk. So if we're in the second attack frame, that's going to be frame 0, 1, 2, 3. Right? And then here in our game code, we're going to go ahead and attack. But uh, we need input for one to attack. So we're going to go ahead and check for the space key being, being pressed. And if the space key is pressed, then we're going to go ahead and attack. So now we can kind of move back and forth, and as we attack, uh, our snake stops moving, even though I'm holding down the arrow keys and hitting space at the same time. Uh, that's because of the logic in our sprite, and that's just kind of how that sprite is written. All right, again, there's a lot about this code I don't like, so let's make it just a little bit prettier. Um, the first thing I want to do is, we really got this notion of state. I um, haven't really talked about state machines yet, but uh, state machines are kind of rampant in game development. There's lots of state machines from AI also to, to uh, characters and sprites. So I'm going to create a walking state that's going to have a movement, a speed, going to have the actual frames of animation, and the time, because that time is kind of useful. Uh, if we start a walk cycle, it might be nice to know when that walk cycle started. We're going to do the same thing for the attack. Now the movement I'm going to have is zero because I don't want the snake to move on attack. I'm get rid of the rest of that code. The only thing we're going to add here is we're going to add a state, and that's going to pull the current state from our hash. Right? And that's going to be useful because we're not going to have to check every, you know, everywhere else what's, what state we're in. Um, to know if we're attacking, we're actually going to have to look at the specific attack state. Um, and instead of just being the instance variables on the object, we're going to look at the, in the hash. When we attack, we're also going to update that, that hash. Now our movement actually has gotten a lot better because uh, we're no longer checking to see if we're walking, we just move the x coordinate by whatever's in the state. So attack has no movement, so it doesn't move. We can also simplify our animation frame logic as well. We don't need to have two separate code paths, one for walking and one for uh, attack, uh, because we're just going to pull all of that out of the state. And we can even simplify it a little bit further and Uh, simplify it further by uh, actually pulling out the frame from the uh, from the hash. So if we go ahead and look at that, um, it works the same way that it did before. The code is just a little bit cleaner. All right, uh, let's take a look at another example. And 
This is zombie fisticuff coral. I think it's Depths is his name. Um, And this is a fun little game. Also created in 48 hours, and all of the assets were created by him himself. So the opening music is him coming. And the point of this game is just to walk down a street and beat up zombies, which is pretty cool. Um, so this is the developer. I wish I could have this, but I don't know. Um, can I take the monocle? So he's just going to be kind of like a patroller. He's going to go from one side to the next. Um, so let's go ahead and try that. Um, here is our, again, this should look pretty familiar. Here's our patrol game. I separated it onto different files. Uh, it looks a lot like our uh, sprite game. We're going to create a patrolling creep. And here I'm going to set the color to red. I'm gonna, I want to want the different creeps to have different colors. And so I'll go through the logic on how we're going to color these, uh, these sprites. Um, same thing, button down, we're going to close if it's escape, and then we're going to update the creep and drop the creep in the game loop. So, not too, uh, not too unusual from what we've seen before. Here's our creep definition. Uh, the difference between what we've done previously and this one is our x and y coordinate, instead of being the upper left hand corner of the sprite that we're going to draw, I want that to be the dead center of our, of our creep. Sprite. Uh, and I'll, I'll we'll explain kind of why that is uh, as we get into it a little bit further. Uh, but we're going to create our circle image, and then our default color is going to be white, but we set this one to be red in our game loop. We really don't have anything to do on update, and when we draw, we're going to take our center, we're going to offset that by the right <coughs> angle of our circle, and so we're going to make sure that we're going to draw our circle in the, in the right place. Okay? Um, the other thing that we want to do, though, is we want to add the start and the end locations. So I think by default what we'll do is we'll start at the cycle height and width, so in the upper left-hand corner of the screen, and then we want to end at the bottom right-hand corner minus the height and width of the circle. So I'm the world's slowest typist, so it's kind of painful for me to watch you. So uh, we're also going to keep track of the target. This is kind of more of a, a state machine aspect of this creep. Uh, then we want to actually get our target, whether that's a start or end. And then when we reverse ourselves, we're just going to change the uh, target. If it was pointed at end, we're going to point at start. <coughs> so to hopefully pretty simple. The next thing we want to do is we want to uh, get a method that's going to take x and y coordinate and actually set that for us. Uh, this is going to be useful so we can set this outside of this, uh, this class in our game. All right. The other thing we want to do is we want to know if we're near the target. So we're going to talk a little bit here about one of the methods that GoSu gives us, which is a distance calculation. So if you take a set of x and y coordinates and a set of other x and y coordinates, it'll give you the distance between those two points. So we, we're going to know that we're near a target if that distance between where we are now 
and that target is less than what we are moving at any given loop. Okay, so now that we've got uh, kind of our infrastructure here, we're gonna do, we're gonna take use of the update method in our game for the first time. First thing we're gonna do is we're gonna get the angle of where our X and Y current, current center is and where our target is, and this is where we want to go on the map. Once we've done that, we're gonna take that angle and we're gonna offset our X coordinate by our distance plus that, uh, that angle, and then we're also gonna offset our Y coordinate as well. And again, GoSu gives us some really nice helper methods so that we don't have to do all this math ourselves. The next thing we're gonna do in our update is we're gonna reverse if we're near our target. So that way if we're near N, we're gonna turn around and go back to Y, or to start. And we're just gonna make sure I correct the spell in the window. And move on. Right. So here's it running. As you can see, our red circle is now going from the upper left to the bottom right. Um, you know, that's kind of boring. I think it would be better if we had more creeps than just the one. Uh, so we're going to go ahead and add six of them. And we're just going to be basically the same thing. We're going to create a new creep. Um, instead of having them all start at the same place, let's, uh, let's go ahead and assign them each a random color and a, a random <coughs> position for the start and a random position for the end. And once we do this, we can get rid of our previous creep instance variable, and we can change the, our update and draw as well. Uh, we have to implement color. Um, this color code comes from some of the GoSu examples. And then a random position, I think we're just going to, for now, let's just pick a random place. Um, a little bit later, I'm going to use a slightly different algorithm for what the random position is and what's, uh, what's an acceptable position. So for now, Let's go ahead and uh, update and draw our creeps. And so hopefully, we're going to see a bunch of different creeps running around on the screen. And in fact, we do. <coughs> some of them don't go very far, some of them go far. Um, it's just kind of look at the draw. All right, again, it's kind of what we saw before. Some things are happening on the screen without our involvement for the most part. Let's add something that we can, that we can move, something we can control. So I'm going to add a control player, and basically, I'm a copy and paste programmer, so I'm going to take or create and just make him a player, and then remove all the things that I don't need. Uh, so the start and end, I really don't need. Um, the target, none of that, I don't need for a player. Um, I think our start position, we're going to need that for our x and y coordinate. But yeah, target, reverse, start, near, we don't need any of that. Uh, now, here on our update, we're getting our angle from our x and y coordinate and our target. So we need a different algorithm to get our, uh, our angle that we're going at. So let's just get it from something called current angle. And we'll add that later. Actually, we'll add it now. Uh, current angle is going to look at our window and see what buttons are pushed. If we're pushing left, right, up, or down in a combination, we're going to get an angle. If none of our buttons are pushed, then we're, our angle is going to be nil. And so, um, here's the logic for that. Um, again, there may be a built-in way to get this or to, to map this out. This is just kind of brute forced here. But it works, and I think it's, it's pretty understandable. Um, so straight up is angle of zero. Straight to the right is angle of 90. Down is 180. If we're pressing both up and left, or up and right, then it's going to be 45, and so on and so forth. So there you can see the, our, uh, our logic to determine the angle. If we have an angle, we want to, uh, we want to offset our x and y coordinate. So we're going to move only when we're pressing a button. All right, so here's our, our control player. We left him white. And he gets to move around and kind of interact with all of the other uh, circles. Again, we're controlling it, but there's something missing. Like, I expect something to happen as I went around and did that. If there's nothing, there's no danger, there's no peril here. The games are supposed to be fun and exciting, and I don't see any of that. 
Okay, so what we're going to do is when we update each of our creeps, we're going to move the creep, and then what we really want to know is, is that creep clipping us, right? Do we have, is it touching us? And if that creep is touching us, then we lost. So this will be kind of like tag, right? We just want to avoid all of these patrolling creeps. So we're going to take the distance of uh, the current player and the distance of that creep, and we want to make sure that that distance is bigger than its range. And right now we're saying its range is basically the size of the circles. Uh, so here in our uh, creep, we need to add our x and y coordinate because we're using it from our game now. And we're going to add a range. And our range is basically just going to be the width of the circle. <coughs> you know, we can set that so that this creep can have a bigger range or a smaller range. And on our player, this, we're also going to need to get our x and y center coordinates. So now that we've done that, again, we haven't written a whole lot of code. We're just checking to see if the distance is close. If it is, then we're just going to print fail and we're going to close. So here is a game. We kind of wander around and we get touched and it says fail and we're dead. So it's kind of game-like. Let's try it again. Yeah, it still fails. Okay, so more than just failing, it would be nice if you could actually beat the game and win, have a sense of accomplishment. <laughs> so uh, I think what we want to do is we're going to start in the upper left-hand corner. Maybe we should go down to the bottom right-hand corner. And once we get to that position, then we'll win, we'll win the game. So here we have that. Uh, if you go back just a little bit. I added this win position right there on line 19. So if the player's uh, x and y coordinate equals at 760 and 560, then uh, let's go ahead and uh, say that we won that game. OK, so uh, after we've updated the player, we're going to say, hey, is your x and your y, does that equal the win position? And if so, then we should probably uh, put win, and then we should close. Now when we do that, I'm just going to fast forward a little bit. We get all the way down, we're untouched, but we get to this bottom, and it's really, really, really difficult to get into that position. Okay. So one of the things we can do is, uh, well, we should probably round off, have a better round for the x and y coordinate. Uh, but our circle is able to go outside of the bounds of the existing level, which is that our level is for all intents and purposes for the bounds of the screen. So on our player, we probably need to give our player some bounds. Um, and we're just going to go ahead and make that uh, the circle width minus 0 0.49, just so the rounding you know, evens out. Um, and then we'll take the window height minus the half of the circle height as well. So that way, we're starting at 40, 40, and we're going to 760 and 560. So we got our bounds. Um, now when we update here, we're just going to check and see if we're outside of those bounds, then we're going to set to be inside of the bounds. And that's basically it. So if we pop out at all, we're going to move back in. All right, so let's try that. Now if I kind of move outside of the bounds of the window, I'm not able to. And I'm able to move all the way over. I hit that bottom corner, and it says win. So ladies and gentlemen, that was kind of gamey, but it'd be nice if it looked a little more fancy, I think, you know? So one of the things I'm going to do is I'm going to trick it. What we're going to do is, right now we're dealing with a full 800 by 600 X and Y coordinate. What I want to do is I want to fake it out and squish everything so we're dealing with 800 by 300 instead of 800 by 600. I'll show you how we're going to accomplish that. That's going to kind of give us the illusion of looking at something from a 45 degree angle. Now again, I think there are better ways to do isomorphic displays, but it, uh, probably not 45 minutes. Okay, so uh, the first thing I want to do is I'm going to pull up a background image. And that image is going to show us the bounds of our playing field on the screen. So there's going to be area on the screen that we are not actually able to go to and that is not playable bounds. So we're going to denote that by the background. So there it is. The gray bar is our background. 
uh, but our creeps are flying all over the place. In order to make sure that our creeps do not fly all over the place, and this will be really hard to see, we're going to take our x and y coordinate as they currently are today. Now the y coordinate, what we want to do is if you're at seven or 500 pixels down, really I want you to be at 250 pixels down offset by whatever that top bar is. So this is what I've done. So we're going to take our existing x or y coordinate, we're going to divide that in two, and then add 20, right? So we're going to squish the playing field and kind of drop it down. Uh, we're going to do the same thing for the player. So now as we do that, um, this is the exact same game, but uh, it's insane, much more difficult because it's hard to tell as we move up and down. You know, like we can move much further left and right than we can up and down and uh, we get caught a lot easier. But the game still works, right? Um, all we haven't really changed any of the logic, we've only changed the visual representation on the screen. I think that's a real game. I think I accomplished the goal, surprisingly enough. You can play it, you can win it, and you can lose it. And it kind of goes, so yay, real game. All right, so um, what happens if we skip ahead, right? So there's a lot more things, that we, we talked about the sprites, um, we know we've got kind of this like oval-shaped bounding box that if our creeps hit us, um, you know, what more can we show? I wasn't sure how much time I'd actually have, um, and so it was. In fact, are we over? How much time do we have? Five minutes. Okay. All right. So let's skip ahead. Um, here's the project. Um, now, every step along the way is a different commit within the Git repo. So you can go and get up on GitHub and look at each individual step and do a dip and see what was changed. Um, but let's look at a Ruby game. Uh, Ruby game's got a bunch of different assets. It's got uh, ninjas and snakes and different levels. Uh, let's go ahead and run this. This is live. Demo. Begin. All right. So here's my snakes. And as you get close, they'll start to sing. I don't know if you can hear that, but as you, as you run around. You win. Yay! <laughs> I started to get three. If we continue, now we get four. Let's go ahead and get caught. Fail. Now we failed. Um, and we were defeated. We can still win. And there you go. You win. Okay. So there's more games than this. Um, let's take another example. This is uh, from Ryan Davis. This is a zombies, a zombie uh, apocalyptic simulator. Uh, so the white dots you might be difficult to see are uh, normal humans. The green dots are zombies. The, uh, I think the purple dots are zombies that are attacking, the yellow dots are people that are fleeing, and then there's like priests that collect people. Uh, but this is just a simulation. Uh, there's not a whole lot of input, but it does kind of show the spread of zombiness in a population of random people. And it's kind of, I kind of want a screensaver out of this. This is pretty cool. I'm trying to convince him to release the code so everyone can see. That's pretty sweet. Um, also, there's also a Frogger example by Aja. So this is Frogger. This is about 200 lines of, of Ruby code. But you can... Oh, <laughs> much more difficult than you would think. Uh -oh. And over here it says win. There's more.
more to this as well. There's a really fantastic physics library called Chipmunk. Um, so if you've seen like the Angry Birds game, uh, where you're throwing stuff at a structure, you can build something like that. One, one of my original goals was to build a, a, a Angry Birds clone. I don't think I have enough time. Uh, but it's all there. It's, it's a lot like Gosu. It's written in C, and it's got first-class Ruby bindings. And so there's a lot of games. Um, there's some examples that are using Chipmunk as well. Uh, there's another really great library called uh, TextPlay. If you've ever had problems getting R Magic installed, TextPlay is also a very lightweight C or C++ library that's got great uh, Ruby bindings, um, and it can make uh, drawing circles and triangles a lot easier. Um, there's a site called Let em Dare. This is what I was talking about before, where these uh, developers will get sit down and over the course of a weekend, over the course of 45 hours or 48 hours. They'll create a game completely from scratch, right? So any existing like uh, library or framework code you can use, uh, but all of the art assets, all of the sounds, all of the music has to be created, and all the code, uh, your game code has to be created by you in 48 hours. And those constraints have um, delivered some really interesting uh, types of games. Uh, here's something that I'm kind of, I, this is an idea that I really, really like. I want to see a lot of games as gems, right? Like I would love to see, uh, like Dave Thomas talked about, going out and inspiring people not like yourself. Uh, going out and like teaching kids how to program games in Ruby, and then distributing those games as gems. Just gem install game and play, right? It, it seems like that's an idea whose time should, have, should come. Again, my name is Mike Moore. Uh, I'm Blomage, or Blomage. That doesn't matter how you say it. On Twitter and pretty much everywhere else. Uh, here's my email address. Um, Again, on GitHub, Z OMG Games. Uh, and again, it's November, uh, so go to Games with Balls and uh, contribute. And questions? Yeah. Is there a hand up? Over here. Um, do, you, do you know of any things we're doing like free stuff? Yeah, Gosu actually uh, will integrate with Ruby GL. And so you can do all of your uh, OpenGL programming in Ruby and column directly to it. And then it also gives you the rendering display so you can print it and stuff. If you look at the GOSU examples, there's an actual example that shows a uh, rotating 3, 3D uh, map, you know, um, and you're like a ship flying over it. But it's, it's full 3D through OpenGL. Yeah? Do you have any recommendations for executable packaging? Um, the, the name of the, of the App escapes me, but there is, um, if you go on the GoSu forums, there is a Ruby to executable um, package manager that will uh, take all of you, take your Ruby interpreter, all of your code, all of your gems, package it up into a single EXE that you can deploy. So this is how the Ruby guys de deploy their games uh, at these competitions. You can also take GoSu and package it up as a Mac application and, uh, and deploy it that way. But I, I kind of like the idea of, of gems. I kind of think. Games should be gems. Anything else? Yeah. Are the videos that you have available online? Uh, sure. Yeah, I think Concrete is recording it, and we'll put it up. <laughs> yes, sir. Yeah. So. He's actually right. We are. Yeah. See, Concrete's right here. So. Uh, yeah. Hopefully, uh, soon. I'll I'll annoy Kobe to do it soon. Did any of the other game, Ruby game frameworks besides Gosu? Um, I, I liked Gosu just because it was so minimalistic. I didn't want to didn't want to get lost, you know, in dealing with the library. I really wanted to deal with the concepts, and so I, I kind of looked at it and I didn't really play with them. I, I'm more of a minimalistic kind of guy, and I kind of like Gosu. I, I, I it's pretty, really clean. It is pretty clean. Is there another question to hand over here? I'm sorry, what's that? Mac Ruby. Oh, Mac Ruby? Yeah. Um, the, it's a C++ library, and so they've got bindings, uh, but they've got a version of the Gosu gem that runs on the Mac. I haven't really uh, seen anything with Mac Ruby. I think if you're dealing with Mac Ruby, you're already so specific to that platform that you would just go ahead and uh, use the Cocoa libraries to do your, your drawing. So. All right, thank you guys. Uh,